Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to um, thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, this evening, when the welcome to our using wastewater to measure COVID nineteen virtual event, uh, I'm Albert, an OSPE uh, Exchange Hub Ambassador at the University of Guelph. I'm a PhD student in engineering, studying climate change and its impacts on water resources. I'm passionate in research and teaching and volunteering, of course. Uh, I'm happy to be there too with you this evening. In 2019, OSP has launched exchange hubs at some academic institutions across Ontario. The five hubs were launched at McMaster University, Queen's University, Ryerson University, University of Guelph, and University of Windsor. The intent is to provide the individual OSP members with opportunities to collaborate on concerns relevant to engineering, regardless of career stage, in a multidisciplinary environment and initiatives specific to geographic sectors. I'm saying in saying that uh, OSP's Guelph Exchange Hub organized this in using wastewater to measure COVID-19 virtual panel event to discuss potential benefits of wastewater surveillance to combat COVID-19. Now, let's jump right into it. I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight with us this evening, Dr. Ed McBean. He is a University of Guelph Professor of Engineering and Leadership Chair Professor in Water Security. And he is a former Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Water Supply Security and now University of Guelph Research Leadership Chair Professor. In that context, he relies upon statistic, statistical interpretation of data, fate and transport of chemicals and pathogens in the environment, and risk assessment and management to determine how features of water supply risk may arise. Therefore, there are dimensions of numbers of features, including climate change and fate and transport modeling as applied to water resources phenomena. In addition to the above, Dr. McMean also has extensive ex experience in waste management and greenhouse gases emissions as contributing to the global um, climate change. And now uh, let me hand over my microphone to Dr. McBean and he shall start his uh, presentation for tonight. Okay, thank you, Albert, and uh, good evening, everybody. I'm not sure whether it applies to everyone, but regardless where I am, it does. What we're talking about tonight is sewage analysis as a tool for COVID-19 pandemic response. And uh, it is a mind-boggling difficult problem, as we'll see, and I mean, it's obvious you hear about it so much, it's almost to the point of tuning out now. But you also have to realize that I'm an engineer, I consider myself an expert in wastewater, but I'm not an expert on laboratory protocols. So if you ask me any really complicated questions, I will have difficulty. However, I also want to acknowledge all of my team members and uh, these they're listed here, I won't go through all the names, but uh, a significant research team at the University of Guelph. And I'm obviously referring to some of the things I'm doing, but also obviously what they do. And I also want to acknowledge Dave McCarthy. He's at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. And he has been very, very helpful in terms of some of the elements. And I'll be showing some of his slides in this presentation. <clears throat> I also need to acknowledge who's paying all the bills in terms of hiring the postdocs and, and the students, et cetera, to do the various parts of work. Enter COVID-19 special funding program, Ontario Ministry of Health, and the University of Wealth have all been contributing substantially. So all of that's very well. Well, it's not going to be anything to, that's going to be surprising. We have an ongoing global pandemic caused by severe respiratory syndrome, also known as coronavirus 2, et cetera. And it has caused 118 million people to be infected. And this number is now outdated substantially and 3 million deaths globally. So this is really uh, frightening to say the least. Okay, so challenges and limitations uh, in terms of testing of individuals. In other words, how do we get so far how much information that we've obtained and how do we obtain it? Well, what we're doing is clinical testing and that's the proverbial thing where they poke something up your nose and, and whisk it around and so on. And what they're doing then is testing to see if people are positive. Well, if you look down here, and I'm assuming you can see my cursor, uh, children aged zero to nine were 
asymptomatic, meaning they do not show any uh, any symptoms. 35% of them in that particular category. And one symptom, which is in this case temperature or elevated temperature, 31.4%. So you've got 62% of people that don't really show very much in this particular age category. Um, and still the value, the numbers of people that are asymptomatic in all the age categories is still substantial. And if you look at Ontario, we have utilized 8.4 million tests, in other words, people's noses being poked, of which 219,000 have tested positive. That not rocket science to figure out the mathematics of that is pretty rare. In other words, only 2.6% of those tested have been found to be positive. So that's and that's uh, January 10th, but it doesn't matter. It's still indicative. So there's an inherent self-selection bias. In other words, people who show up tend to have symptoms. What about the asymptomatic? We, we don't know. <clears throat> and the result is that this kind of clinical uh, characterization, uh, the public health officials can only respond after the disease has infected many people and, and or reached epidemic status in the case of COVID-19, and they're relying on clinical testing. Well, then it's already a problem. What about can we find out ahead of time that there is a problem? So asymptomatic, that's a big problem. Cough, fatigue, fever, headache, shortness of breath, sore throat, no symptoms, etc. All sorts of possibilities. And some of them that are asymptomatic, meaning no symptoms, they are actually just pre-symptomatic. In other words, they will show up a few days later. But retesting everybody, that's just not feasible. It's so expensive and so, so challenging. Now, what we look at in the way of trying to look for wastewater is that the COVID virus shows up, basically, an individual who is infected shows their fleets, millions, if not billions, of viral genomes into the wastewater per day. This is a huge number, obviously. And regardless of whether you're asymptomatic, in asymptomatic or not, um, they're going to come out. In other words, they're going into the wastewater. So in other words, it's a certain amount of RNA per gram of stool as associated with an individual who's tested positive. Now, also important is that in the medium duration of virus shedding feces is about 22 days. So in other words, it's not a one-day thing. It's a series of days. So really lots to think about. Well, we've used, as I said, 28 million tests. We only have 3% of the Canada's population have been infected. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. That's wonderful that it's that low. But what it also means is 97% of the people have not been infected. Whoa, okay. As of January 20, 2021, there were 23,000 deaths. So lots of people have not been infected, so their feces are coming as well. So that's going to complicate some of the issues for wastewater. But let's not make it complicated yet. Okay, clinical testing then is reactive. In other words, rather than identifying the outbreaks are starting to happen, they're already there before they actually realize it. So the key is viral shading. <clears throat> Sewer systems, what they do is they provide us a snapshot, a very rapid characterization. In other words, the two hours or five hours, or perhaps in a very big city, even a day. But what happens is sewer systems provide a fast snapshot and um, providing information that, oh, there's a lot of people out there that are excreting viruses, or that would be the indication of an epidemic. <clears throat> we call it wastewater-based epidemiology, or WBE, as I will be referring to it. Now, we've actually been using WBE for a long time, in, well, not long, but uh, polio in Israel and Brazil, looked at in 1999, infection of illicit drugs in population, Salmonella in Hawaii. And then also, and just keep in mind these guys, norovirus, norovirus, rotavirus, hepatitis A, those are not enveloped viruses. That will be important later. But obviously now what we're dealing with is COVID-19. So what happens is there are viral fragments that come out for six weeks in the feces of individuals who are infected. The Wastewater monitoring then allows us to be able to capture uh, and analyze what's in that wastewater and potentially see then overall decreases or increases. 
This is not simple, but it, it is feasible. So what we have is the ability for, without knowing and sampling by the clinical test, we can identify new waves that are actually starting to, to happen. And that's the key. Okay, so this is a, a very quick description, but it's what's happening is you've got RNA, which means the genome of the virus is basically uh, RNA. And <clears throat> one copy has fragments, and we'll, we'll characterize them by NN1 and N2. These are non-infectious. So in other words, they have characteristics that we can utilize, but they will not uh, cause hazards in the laboratory. That's obviously key to uh, undertaking. What happens, though, is as the RNA gets into a human cell, they have a spike protein that allows them the RNA to enter into the host cell, in this case, a, a person. Um, and then they utilize the different proteins to actually replicate themselves. So when they get in there, then they start to produce more. They, so in other words, a, a dramatic growth of and uh, of these viruses now because the right proteins are there to allow them to grow. And then when the cell of the host uh, dies, uh, the virus multiplies, virus particles burst out of the dead cell and infect new cells and clearly things just happen very quickly. That's the key. The problem is that the viruses misinstruct the host cell's machinery to do the translation and replication of virus genome instead of the host. So they have the ability to change what happens within the cell. And that's the key that allows the replication and subsequent uh, explosion of the number of, of um, RNA things. So <clears throat> what we've got is an early warning system. We're allowing then intervention. We can tell if a second or third wave is happening again. Well, all the sounding is very helpful, this is not trivial because we've got to find the right materials, we've got to extract it, we've got to detect it, and then we've got to do subsequent analysis. That's not easy to do, but it is feasible. And that's what, it's, it's a very promising area. I don't want to sound negative, I just don't want to make it sound like it's easy. These are the steps of the process. We collect the sample, we concentrate it, we extract, and then we detect. And these things above this basic report of line show what we're actually doing. Now, when I say sample collection, there are a number of ways. We might have a grab sample, but that's almost useless because if you take a grab sample from a sewer, if the feces are not there at the right time, you don't collect them. Alternatively, you might have an auto sampler or you might have something called a passive sampler. And I'll refer to those more specifically because the grab sample isn't very helpful. We then concentrate it and through a centrifuge, we remove the safe supernate, which then contains what it is we're trying to measure and store that pellet of information. And without getting too detailed, but basically we then e extract the total genetic material from the pellet. And in turn, then we have to bring it back up to uh, reverse transcription or multiply it basically to um, actually be able to measure it. Okay, so that's what's happening and we'll get a sense of it you know, as we go through. So what we're really looking for is N1 and N2 gene targets. They are part of the RNA fragments. Now, part of the problem we gotta be careful about is you can damage these fragments as you try to extract them. And that's a problem because if we damage them too much, then we won't get any measurements. And then after we ex uh, extract and we reverse the transcription, then we put it into an RT, RT uh, qPCR and amplify it. So that's how we, the process. The other thing that's important is this PNMOV or hypermobile uh, model virus. It's a good uh, internal reference. It has similar characteristics to the SARS, but it's fairly consistent. So in other words, what we're allowed to do is to do the sampling at the, at the individual level, but then bring it back to or normalize to get back to a representation of how much is actually in a feces it is in the wastewater that we are analyzing. And that can then be a good surrogate indicator of the fecal uh, pollution. That's how we multiply it back up to get a, a normalized effect. And I realize that's pretty quick, but let's carry on regardless. What we're doing, and this is 
partially going back to that sense of the extraction tubes and so on. We've got to get out the RNA that we want. And so basically you have glass beads and you vibrate them back and forth. This allows then uh, lysis buffers and the uh, uh, vortex uh, to basically move them out to the outside. And what we're doing is destroying the envelope. Now that's going back. Remember I said this was an enveloped virus. So keep that in mind. When we destroy the envelope, that uh, virus is no longer able to infect. So that's why it's able to be done in, in the laboratory without uh, horrific fear for one part of the technicians. That's key. <clears throat> so what we're doing is we're moving the envelopes, the membranes, the proteins, other debris, leaving the RNA in solution. Okay. Then what we do is take the RNA for the processing, and that's where we actually amplify it now to get the N1 and N2, to get the number of N1 or N2 uh, fragments per liter of wastewater. Okay, that's that's good. So we're getting getting a measure of how many of those viruses are there in that that have been excreted by uh, people that are contributing to that material. So just as an example, this is uh, out of Ottawa. The wastewater signal using N1 and N2, no detection in mid-July. What happened was they showed that the wastewater already was showing, whoa, there's a big wave starting to happen in Ottawa. They were 48 hours ahead of the clinical positive cases. So that's indicative of we get an advanced warning because remember what's happening is we're getting that conveyance of the wastewater with the feces and the infections that are in the virus. Now we're able to capture them in a matter of a few hours and then do the analysis. Later. So <clears throat> and one and two then using the PMMOV follows the signal. And uh, basically, it was a very classic case of a nice uh, example. And I'll show you an example of it specifically in a few minutes. Okay, so wastewater uh, based epidemiology systems offering near real-time outbreak data. That's really great. We can detect overall increases or decreases. We can, we do reflect uh, asymptomatic cases. Good, so we're not missing those when, when they're not necessarily, people only go to get the test if they either are forced to or they have symptoms. But if they're not either of those, we don't know how many of them there are up there in terms of actually being infected. So, WBE has potential to comprehensive, comprehensively monitor the spread of an infectious disease in near real time at the community level. Hmm, that's good. But is it only that? The community level? That's that's still, you know, Toronto, sub portions thereof, or even the city of Guelph, there's 130,000 people. But think about how we might be able to do this. I could carry this point where I sample, not all the way down to the wastewater treatment plant, but instead at the, at the uh, schools, at the university housing, at congested public housing, I can monitor the wastewater as it comes out of those particular individual locations and find, whoa, there's a lot of people that are affected within that particular building. So that's one of the keys is, yes, we can do it at the city, but we can also do it at the individual locations which might have uh, this significant virus. So, for example, in Australia, they were able to find the key sources by basically traveling around, collecting samples of wastewater at different locations and finding, okay, this is the area that's really a hot spot. Then you can di direct where the clinical testing should be targeted. Now, so in other words, we can move upstream or downstream to isolate where the viruses are emanating from. A huge advantage. We don't have to wait and try to do the testing and figure it out. We can get the information quickly. So now, I said some of the challenges were substantial and they are. The RNA uh, in the sewers is de destroyed to some extent. Remember what I said about an envelope. If we destroy the envelope, and remember, and this is going to be a little bit repetition, but think about how often we were told at the outset, wash your hands. What you're really doing is using the soap or chlorine, or many detergents, and so on, all sorts of different things that can destroy the RNA. It basically 
they're destroying the virus. Well, that's all good. And that's why you wash your hands. But on the other hand, we're trying to monitor to find out how many people are infected. That's not good. So destruction of the RNA in the sewers is a problem. Also, if you think about a sewer, there's a lot of infiltration, ingress, ambient water, and people that are not infected, etc. So sewers blend any variations into an average. So they tend to smooth things out. Now, clearly, if you're monitoring a particular public housing project, for example, if, if you felt that was a hot spot, you won't have that problem in terms of averaging so much. But you, if you're down at the wastewater treatment plant, then clearly you do. So COVID-19 has poor stability in wastewater. It's more susceptible to disinfectants. And that's what I referred to, remember at the outset, adenoviruses, rotavirus, etc. They are non enveloped so they're different. But that's fine. We just have to deal with what we're, we're being faced with. So COVID-19, it is destroyed to some extent in the transit because of things like chlorine. But on the other hand, we do destroy it. So that's good in that uh, it won't go very far as a result if you have a lot of uh, disinfectants around. So COVID is an envelope virus, so different than these ones. Okay. There's variability in shedding rate, no question. Other factors of viral uh, variable flow conditions. Whoops. Oh, um, but think about stormwater flow, inflow, so on. Things that tend to confound what the concentration is going to be of the virus in the wastewater where we're taking the sample. Um, lots of them, lots of people, fortunately, do not contribute because they are not positive, so they're not contributing to the virus. But it also makes it harder to find the virus. And um, basically, I guess that's sufficient. So timely data from smaller catchments is, is needed to allow us to target public health action. So we can say, okay, that's an area that's particularly highly impacted. Um, we can deploy and, and high resolution monitoring at those similar uh, smaller places. And we can do it at different levels, at the lot, at the suburb, city, and so on. So let's just look very quickly. This is the University of Guelph. Here are two residences. These are the married student housing. And then these three blocks up here are uh, single individual rooms for um, individuals. And these are the residences. So we were monitoring these locations. And here's an example of one of the towers in the what we call the East Tower. So here are, just ignore this guy over here because he's always following me around. Uh, I, you'll notice that the, the highly paid guy isn't working very hard. But anyway, that's me. Um, but here's the student who is, where did my cursor go? There we go. Um, she is using a peristaltic pump. So one of the problems, of course, is the sewers where we're trying to sample are down to perhaps seven meters. Well, peristaltic pumps only have the ability to bring it to the surface, you know, in a certain amount of time. So that's okay, but that's one way to get a, uh, you know, a particular sample. So she's getting effectively a grab sample at this location. We'll change that in a few minutes. But look at over here at this other situation. You got. These two things here, and really what they are is we call them boats, but that's just a term. Just to, what we do is this is called a passive sampler. So we put certain kinds of materials in here. We have the wastewater flow passed, and what that those materials will do is to absorb some of the viruses as they are going by. So in other words, we can put it in there at nine o'clock this morning and pick it up at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. And we'll have a reflection of how much was passing through in that location. And I knew you'd want to look at the uh, inside of the sewer. So this is what it is. That's what you see down. It's really fascinating. <clears throat> Here's a sample. And then we're obviously taking that off. I've got to go a little bit faster. So I'm not going to run out of time. But grab samples, auto samplers, absorption technology. This is one that they've used quite successfully in Australia. It is an auto sampler inside this vessel. And what they do is they put it into a, you can see kind of a straps that they can lower it into because sometimes your manhole is in the middle of an emergency pathway. You cannot leave a sampler there. But in this case, what they do is they put it down there and then cover it over so you cannot even tell that the auto sampler is there. And, you know, in their case, they have more uh, 
functional climate in terms of not being cold. But regardless, that is one way to do it. And the theft, et cetera, is a problem always when you leave uh, materials in the field. So here is an example of a passive sampler. So or you can see here the size of the, of the instrument or the sampler is being held in this person's hand. What you're doing is you're, you're going to put this into the stream of wastewater going by. This will allow then entry here of and passage through a particular kind of sorptive material. And we're testing different sorptive materials. Some are better than others and so on. I won't go into all of that because it takes too long, but this allows us to get three different types of, of, of passive samplers to collect the information. And this is just an example of what one of those looked like, you know, in terms of it's been stuffed down into this, this location here. Okay. Um, here it is, another situation. Uh, so what we're doing then is passive samplers. We're using Q-tips of all things, but they work really quite well. We're using gauzes. We're using charged membranes, all of which will sorb in different ways in different circumstances. And then we mesh. We have a wrapped mesh around the whole support structure to allow the sewage. Remember, toilet paper, that's a big problem. It tends to get fouling and so on, clogging of the samplers. So there's a mesh surrounding. And you can see that mesh here where the sampler is, you know, clearly it's inside this thing. And, and the one in the middle is indicative of the actual collection of the feces, et cetera, in there. But it avoids the fouling that's created by the uh, toilet paper. These are just some other examples, but you can see the same kind of sense of it. This one has a sequence of the, but again, the entry point is located here, picks up and absorbs some of the particulates, in this case, uh, including obviously the, uh, the viruses. And this is an example of one that has been in operation, or use for the last day. Okay, so that's how it works. It's a passive sampler. It's simple. It's inexpensive. And what it does is concentrate sample during the collection. We've used cotton swabs, we've used tampons, we've used torpedoes, which we just call them torpedoes, but Q-tips, uh, electronegative filters, and so on. Now, here's the example that I referred to earlier in terms of auto. They have, obviously, as over a series of many months, these are the number, this, I, I'm sorry, I'm colorblind, but I think it's green, um, shows you the number of positive cases that you're finding. Uh, by the clinical or on the surface of the you know, area uh, you know, for the people. Whereas this other one that is jumbly and so on, but you can see that they peak at the same time and they are indicative then of what's happening in terms of the viral signal. So like seven day midpoint mean of the viral signal. So the signal is telling us an awful lot about what's going on. In this case, it's for a significant part of the world. So you cannot tell where the hotspots are, all, but you do get a useful characterization of how many people are positive out there. Yes, there was a decline at this period, November, December. There's a decline here in February, March. But as you all know now, we're in the middle of the lockdown and huge increases. That's the variance and so on. I won't go into those because it would take too long. Now, this is an example of a test that we're doing. This is actually a wastewater pilot plant that we have at the University of Guelph, immediately adjacent to the city of Guelph. And what we do is we can bring the sewage into this, and basically it's just symptomatic of, of a, uh, it's an ability to put in here these passive samplers or torpedoes, as we call them, in here and test different kinds of fabric material. We also have right beside it, auto sampler, so we're getting comparison between different sorbents and auto samplers versus sorbents. So this one is much more difficult because you've got to have somebody there to you know, put the sample together, do the analysis on that. This one, you just keep losing my cursor, but anyway, this one is actually in here and we can retrieve it. And we have been after two hours, after four hours, six, 12, and see how long does it take before you get saturation. So just an example of how we compare one methodology versus another. Both have very good merits, but 
you can see how simple the methodology is of the passive samplers when they're basically the torpedoes are, are strung in here and the wastewater is coming through, it's pumped over from the raw wastewater of the city of Paul over to this pilot plant and then we can operate it for uh, as long as we wish. Here's what the inside of the composite sample looks like. Obviously, if you're collecting 24 samples, you can put them all together and get a representative sample. That's the idea at least. Um, again, just different kinds of torpedoes, different kinds of samples in here. And this is an example of where the wastewater is coming in and then it flows down through this, um, this uh, contraption that we set up as a tubing system that allows us to then compare one methodology relative to another. And these are just examples. I think in the interest of time, I won't go into it any much more, but basically what you're seeing is here's the extraction kit, uh, automated, etc. But we get out of that the RNA. Then we have the, uh, you know, using reverse transcription quantitative PCR. Uh, this is the qPCR machine and so on. That's how we do the quantification. Well, okay, destruction of the envelope for COVID. Remember, it was an enveloped uh, virus, uh, but we do suffer from soaps, uh, surfactants, disinfectants, etc. They dissolve the envelope and they expose the RNA for physical damage. That's good for us in the way to kill it, but um, bad for us in trying to get a good measure of how much is there, it's the pump. And this is what I was just referring to earlier about. That's why you were told for the last 14 months, wash your hands because they are envelope. Destroy that envelope and you will destroy the infectability of the virus. Well, it, you can now put the sample, you, it takes about eight minutes. In other words, when we get a sample delivered from the field, in other words, somebody brings the sample, the passive sampler to the laboratory, it takes about eight minutes to prepare it. They then either put it into a minus 80 degrees fridge, which is what this thing is, or you can do it if you have the time. You can actually uh, do the analysis right then. But you got to have the backup because the number of samples is fairly large. Okay, so here's the outbreak at the University of Guelph. And this is the diagram of the picture that I showed a few minutes ago. 50 people attended an unsanctioned gathering on January 15th and 16th. 21st, the university announced that there were seven confirmed cases, and ultimately it became a total of 67 cases that were identified, and nearly doubling, etc. And clearly, a huge problem, and it could multiply quickly in this kind of an environment. And these are what it looks like. This, these are just some examples, and I can't go into it all in detail. But the the blue columns suggest the number of cases that are there and this oh i think it's orange but anyway whatever color that is is showing the the amount that we were measuring by the passive samplers now this is q-tips it's one of the sorbents that we use and probably will continue to use more than one different type but regardless q-tips is one this is membrane filters and you can see that it's not perfect by any means but it's indicative and I, I could go into explanation, but this point should, and this point, the actual zeros should not be plotted there because there was no sample. In reality, there should be a, a dashed line that kind of connects these, although we didn't have samples in here, so we really don't know what the magnitudes were. Regardless, we've got Q-tips, we've got uh, membrane filters, we've got all sorts of different cotton fabrics and so on as ways of looking at in this case, remember the N1 and the N2. This is the average of the two. And the uh, vertical bars are the number of cases. Okay, so we're now using passive sampling. What we're doing is, and over the summer, what we're going to do is, especially in the merit student housing, because the people are basically staying there, the students are uh, in, the, in the single family or residences are, are hitting home and so on. But what we're now going to do is put a, a passive sampler in for every second day. So now we'll be able to tell, okay, if you leave it too long, though, you don't get ahead of it. You don't understand whether things are growing because you wait two days to find out the answer. But you could do it 
more rapidly than that. It just depends on how much you think there might be changes. Okay, so basically, um, viral RNA, it's shed and bodily excreted. That's what makes this whole concept work. It works because that's where the virus is. The variant information, that is becoming available, and evidence is indicating the variants are more transmissible than the original one. I believe that's the reason that uh, we're in lockdown, but um, we don't understand enough about the further ramifications from the variants. They seem to be impacting younger people more frequently, and they seem to be more transmissible, but that's a story for another day. We now have the ability to analyze for most of those types of variants. The most recent one from India is more problematic because it's only just arrived. But we now know the UK and the uh, South Africa and uh, Brazil and so on in terms of variants. Uh, Wastewater-based uh, epidemiology, what that is really good for is you can get a, a variation of circulating streams, strains, to follow the evolution of virus genome between those regions over time. And clearly what you can do is you have the potential to detect the presence of COVID-19 sooner than with random clinical testing because you've got to, somehow you've got to get the people to go there to the testing regime. Then you have to handle And that's not a trivial feat if you've actually had that uh, delayable experience of having something poked up your nose. Um, basically, it, it has the potential to detect, yes, and so on, but it takes time. Then they take it back to the laboratory and so on. So they're already behind the scenes. Whereas wastewater-based epidemiology, we get the information basically as frequently as we can pick up the passive samples, and that's the way we're tending to go, is do them, you know, perhaps leave them in there for a shorter period of time and then be able to say, okay, this is really starting to explode in this particular area. Alternative technologies exist. Uh, we could use auto samplers, but pa passive samplers are more likely to be uh, the most effective. They aren't as expensive, and like the uh, auto samplers are between ten and twelve thousand dollars each, and so you can't have too many of them around. Grab samples? No, not really. I mean, they're okay to have a confirmation, but really, passive samplers are the way to go. Passive samplers have the potential for wide use. Uh, they don't cost very much. In other words, you know, perhaps $10 for the passive sampler. The ease of deployment is really pretty straightforward. And we can get continuous sampling, basically monitoring. It's by absorption process, but we can do that. And it just depends on how frequently we want to pull them out as uh, after they have been within that uh, environment. And the faster we do that, the faster we find out whether the caseload is increasing or not. Uh, <clears throat> basically, it's proving to be an important tool for public health. We're now doing it, in, like Wealth alone is, is doing it in, uh, in I think it's seven different cities. And Waterloo is doing it in, I don't know how many, but a number of cities. Well, subsets of GTA, et cetera, but regardless, what we can do is we can get information back early and we get more informed decisions to prevent and dampen the next waves of the epidemic. We can, or pandemic, sorry, we can figure out an awful lot from what we're observing now. We're learning quickly. Each virus, just as an indication, but the test kits, they're about $20 plus the other laboratory expenses, 30 minutes of technician time to process those sorbent materials. Well, not trivial. But think about what the cost is of having, you know, 500 people waiting in line to get their, their uh, nose booked. So in the scheme of things, it provides important opportunities, insights, and opportunities for huge improvements. Where to test. So we can find, okay, that hot spot is over there, you know, in location X. And we can then find out that very quickly. Then we can get out the actual individual test and say, okay, you got to find out if these people uh, in this hot spot, how many of them are positive and so on respond. Because we cannot tell, obviously, who is the one causing the, uh, the you know, what we're measuring. All we can tell is that there are 
approximately X people, that type of thing. So one of the things we obviously have a lot to learn, and we're improving the characterization of the positive case from, uh, cases, but progress is definitely being made. We are making rapid progress because a lot of effort is being involved. Uh, so I want to definitely acknowledge the uh, colleagues that I referred to on those first couple of slides because of the many insights provided. I also have to acknowledge the funding sources and we are all learning together because we're sharing information very quickly. And obviously I go to so many uh, virtual meetings that makes your head spin. Uh, these are just some examples of the uh, uh, references that I was referring to. So all in all, um, thank you and stay safe. Uh, basically we are studying wastewater very actively to gain advanced local stuff. COVID outbreaks. So with that, I will stop. And uh, yes, uh, thank you, Dr. McBean, uh, for this uh, great presentation. It's very informative and uh, lots of information. Um, so um, if I'm allowed, I would like to, I have, have seen many uh, questions that are being posted from the audience. Um, but mm -hmm. however, I would like to have um, I have three curated questions, and I'm sure some of them are already answered in your presentation, but uh, I'd like to just quickly go over to them. Um, so first one is, can your study of wastewater to combat COVID-19 be transferred to combat other prevalent waterborne diseases in developing countries, such as typhoid? Um, I think it, um, you mentioned that uh, this technology has been used for uh, years already. Yes, wastewater-based epidemiology is a science that we know about. So clearly, the the die-off rate and things that vary with depending upon which particular uh, contaminants you're worried about. And so that's why I said envelope versus non-envelope. They're quite different. So the features are different, but the concept is similar. And it really is effective in terms of saying, okay, uh, we we actually just found a few days ago. There were more sample, more positive tests in a residence at the university. And we went to the people that are at the residence and said, oh, you already know about that. They said, yeah, we do know, because they only found it. So in other words, it does work, and there's no reason it won't work for anything, although the ability to characterize you know, all of the features that can be different because of envelope versus non-envelope makes it difficult, but no, it's uh, epidemiology on base wastewater is a huge future opportunity to, uh, because unfortunately, A, we're, we're still dealing with this darn thing we've got right now, and so on. So, try to make my yeah. answer short. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And the second one, um is more in general, how has the COVID-19 uh, pandemic affected the way engineers uh, look at wastewater practices? I think it's too early to say that it's got that far. Um, there's no question people are starting to, oh, boom, that's really got some merit. But you can see the, we're still trying to understand what the best way to do things. What, what are the best ways? But we're learning quickly. Uh, and I'm on conference calls five times a week, basically across the country. So yes, it's with uh, FAC, uh, Public Health Agency of Canada, and you know all of these people from the ministries, and um, lots of people are getting involved now to, to do the actual analysis at different locations. So yeah. if it's not already, in the curriculum, it's soon will be. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think I'll now go over some questions posted by the audience. Uh, I'll just go by the order. Uh, first one is, um, where do you get the sample uh, at the treatment plant or manholes? I guess you answered in your presentation like both. Get, get well, I did, but it's both. Basically, what we're doing is because the university wants to know if there are outbreaks in residences and in you know, the gymnasium, that sort of thing not used right now, so it's not. But they want to know because they want to be responsive. But on the other hand, uh, we also do it. We have 24-hour composites from the city of Guelph, for example, every day they get analyzed. And 
you know, on and on. So both. Yeah. So uh, the second question is: Is there any chance of uh, contracting COVID while obtaining a sample? No. That first of all, you've got PPE all you know in many dimensions. You've got um, you know the the double vest. You've got the double gloves. You've got uh, face mask and so on. So there's a huge amount of protocol. <clears throat> I didn't really get a chance to go into it in any detail, but also remember the first thing we do once we get it back to the laboratory. The first thing is done within the fume, so that you control any opportunity because it's everything sucked out by the fume. <clears throat> That's the only point where you could actually have a problem. But what we do is do it in the fume. But what they're doing then is destroying the envelope, and then now it's no longer a viable virus. That's the key. So, you know, by all means, being careful is is obvious, but it's also you know, the reasons why. Uh, <clears throat> Many people are saying that there's absolutely no way it's going to survive in the, in the streams. I don't know that for sure. That's not really what I have been looking at. But you know, anyway, uh, yeah, you got to be careful. Yes, be careful is always the not key. Not the least of which is when you pull a, a manhole cover off, you got to make darn sure you don't a drop something down there, uh, or heaven forbid, a person fall in. I mean, yeah. So we'd always have several people and there's a protocol for who does what and all, all those kinds of things. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned the variants as well. So is the test also um, can be applied to the variants? Yes. Yeah, they can. Although the one that's just arrived from India is so new, we don't have the protocols to actually do that. And that's going beyond what I know how specifically to do. But I I did have a meeting with my colleagues today, and we can now test the, the variants. I am actually getting the data from the Minister of Health of Ontario on the variants. Hopefully, it will arrive in the next day or two. We've been asking for it for a month. Um, so we'll, we'll know more, and we are learning more, because those are the ones that are really scary. As I think I heard today 70% of the new infections tend to be the new variants. So that's one of our biggest problems. That's why vaccinations, you got to get them fast. We got to beat this thing before the variants have a chance to go elsewhere. I was enormously happy to hear that Biden was thinking of sending, I think it was 100 million doses overseas, because if you leave it without stopping it in country X, that country can generate, not intentionally, but can generate a new variant, and then you got another problem. And on and on it goes. Yeah, we don't want what's happening last year to happen again, right? No, absolutely. Yeah. So one of the slides you showed, uh, you talked about the cell bursting and taking over the machinery of the cell. Uh, on that slide in particular, uh, there is a question uh, asking, did the University of Guelph complete this research already? Um, well, that's, that's well known in terms of now, at least. <clears throat> I don't know who came up with the first knowledge, but basically you've got a, a spike protein that allows the the virus to infect, you know, go through the cell membrane. And that infects the cell. Now once it's inside, now what it does is misinstruct the cell to now do different things than what the host, meaning the person, wants to do. <clears throat> and then of course the cell dies, and now you you've got replication of the of the virus. And now there's a, an explosion of them that go into infect additional cells. That's, you know, in simple terms, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't actually know who came up with the first knowledge, of it, but it, you know, it is reasonably well. It is accepted. We do understand it. Yeah. Okay. So the next one is: um, Does the severity of the symptoms affect the, the uh, viral load in the feces? So, for that's example, okay. here, would you? Like result be skewed by a high percentage of asymptomatic people, maybe? That's the hardest question to know because, you know, first of all, when you've got different age categories, the ability for a five-year-old to differentiate between, they, they're not good at it. That's why it's, you know, I think it was 36% that we had, might have been 30%. Anyway, a lot of children are asymptomatic because they really don't know what is unusual. 
the older groups, meaning 30, 40 year olds, they're more, you know, I've been coughing and you know, that sort of thing. <clears throat> um, but do we know what the caseload is? You know, the excreta? No, we don't, because that's so individual specific. I suspect eventually, but no, I mean, at least not, not anything that I know. To do. All we're trying to do is solve it the way that I was approaching it. But I would love to know, and there's a lot of argument going on. Yeah, as we are still learning a lot of new stuff from this virus. Um, so how do you determine the sample size required to uh, derive accurate and reflect being reflect, uh, reflective data points uh, on the level of COVID impacts on the ground? On the ground, I'm sorry. I'm not so sure how do you determine the but, sample size that well, is actually reflecting what are you trying to reflect? Well, you know, let's talk passive samplers because that's the easier one to kind of understand. What you've got is how long do you leave that passive sampler? All it's doing is sorbing as the water comes along, the waste comes along. Some things are sorbed, but eventually you're going to reach the point where there's no more sorptive capacity really remaining. <clears throat> so we don't know how long to leave it in there. The longer we leave it, the better representation we'll have in terms of characterization, but the take time to find out the answer. So that's not so good either. So it's a bit of a trade-off. But I think basically what we're doing is we're finding through lots of different ongoing experiments, lots of communication, et cetera, we're finding out what is, um, you know, what's, what's the duration. And, you know, basically the sample size for a passive sampler is how much water do you have to buy. So it's time, not so much anything else. In the case mm -hmm. of the composite sampler, where it's those 24 different separate bottles, that's just, you get, you know, uh, and I could go on for a long time on that, because if you pump it for a couple of minutes, what you're getting is what's in the, in the tube that comes from where you're sampling into the auto sampler. And that's not necessarily indicative of what the what wastewater was at that time. So you've got to be very careful. And the further away the auto sampler is the less uh, realistic it is in terms of what the wastewater is you're trying to sample because you're pumping, you know, what's already been in that pipe, the tube, I should say, not pipe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, so uh, they say um, it takes sometimes two to two, two to three weeks for the virus to be active. Is this a handicap? And do you think is it probably be better to monitor it at the hospital as well? Um, I'm not sure what, well, let me start at the first part. You don't test positive immediately upon exposure. In other words, there has to be that infection of the cells, the explosion of the cells, and, and you know, growth of it over time. <clears throat> so it does take some time. And that's why some people that are asymptomatic are really just pre-symptomatic. They'll show up with the, um, the virus later in terms of the, uh, the symptoms. You know, the health, the coughing, the uh, temperature, and so on. <clears throat> but at some point, and, and then for a significant period, and as I mentioned, the Zhang et al., they had said 22 days was the median. I don't actually do that kind of work. I mean, clearly it has to be understood, but people will excrete the viral segments uh, for, you know, this is not like a, a two day thing. It's longer. Um, we don't know, but obviously people are different. And things like comorbidities, people also influence um, things. And I didn't go into all that, but if you have a previous history of cancer or something, then your chances of being infected differently are very different. And how the feces are in the world, that's, that also is going to be different. Yeah. Not easy. Yeah. Yeah, it's not easy. Uh, and next question, I think you already answered. It's people are, it looks like people are more concerned about the safety uh, for the laboratory people. The question is, are there proactive measures for the person collecting the samples because the virus can exist in sewage for several days? Um, you do mention the PPE and all those protocols in place. Yeah, there's very, very uh, significant extensive protocols to protect the laboratory technician not the least of which is what I did refer to in terms of the, of the fume. These are, you know, um, three, 
three feet or one meter wide and one meter high and so on. And the initial, basically the removal of the envelope and so on, that's done in there so that you know, all of the air is being exhausted. And that's the primary mechanism by which this damn virus is actually proliferating. So you're protecting the person in that respect. But clearly, you got to do this in a very careful We do not culture the virus. That's why we, we use the N1 and N2, because they themselves are not the virus. They are segments of the virus. Yeah. Yeah, safety always comes to the first. So uh, I don't see any questions from uh, the audience uh, right this moment, and it's approaching to the end. I will leave the very last question here um, um, to you as uh, from the curated question bank. Are there any changes caused by this COVID-19 that will continue to be implemented in this industry after the pandemic? I guess more like uh, maybe the monitoring uh, virus will be uh, like a normal thing in the wastewater after this? Well, that's a pretty broad question because there are, we don't even know how many viruses there are. I teach a course in risk assessment, and <clears throat> I used to talk about biology in, um, in the, uh, oh, shoot. Um, I can't think of the name right now, but anyway, not the viruses because we look at the protozoa and we look at the bacteria. That's what I was trying to think of, which is not hard, but anyway. Um, you know, there's thousands of viruses. We don't really understand them. Those darn things can can replicate and, and become a variant so readily. That's the scary part. So, will there be general castovers? I don't. I don't know how you do that. And I'm not saying you can't. I just personally don't. But I, we have just learned how important wastewater epidemiology is. It is going to be a significant part of the future because I was astounded when Bill Gates was interviewed, I don't know, say that, no, 12 months ago, the virus had started to be, you know, holy cow, what's going on in the world? And they interviewed Bill Gates and that guy had actually evidence that he had asked and told people, don't worry about a lot of things, but worry about what kind of viruses that are going to cause problems. He had, you know, obviously he's a white guy and you know that anyway, but um, what happens, I mean, we're learning. And next time will be better. Uh, I'd rather there wasn't the next time, but I unfortunately don't think that's the case. We're going to get them again. So what we've got to do is learn from this the best we can, figure out uh, how do we respond next time, and hopefully, uh, well, I mean, we'll, we'll know better, but, gee, there's lots of room for yeah, we'll keep learning. That's the key. Yeah. 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 So um, I think it's approaching the end of um, our event today. And um, uh, this concludes our panel event. And I would like to sincerely thank you, our speaker, Dr. McBean, this evening, and the Exchange Hub members who took time out of their busy schedule to make this event happen. Uh, and again, thank you for everyone who joined us today. And uh, I hope everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I mean, not to describe what I'm describing, but at least, you know, perhaps uh, maybe a little more insight into what the situation is. Obviously, nothing could be more important than getting rid of the virus as quickly as possible. But, yeah, uh, thank you. As the last word uh, of the event, this event it will be uh, is recorded and will be posted on OSPI uh, YouTube website, and uh, the link is provided in the chat uh, for everyone for anyone who is interested to click on and uh, subscribe. Um, and thank you. This concludes this okay. event, and um, I hope we'll see you guys uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you.